Minas, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. Um, the audience that we are reaching would love to know a little bit about your background. Uh, so can you share with us your professional credentials, where you trained and how we are at this stage having this conversation? Uh, thank you, Deepak. I was trained as undergraduate at Cornell. From there on, I went to MIT and uh, studied uh, physics with uh, Phil Morrison at the Massachusetts of Technology and um, graduated with a PhD in 1972. And Phil Morrison was um, associated with Oppenheimer who uh, developed Phil the Morrison atomic was bomb. associated with Oppenheimer and in fact uh, he was part of the Trinity project and the Manhattan project which uh, eventually led to the dr dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And That's the sad part of science, right? Um, yes, and uh, Morrison, after he went there, you know, to see the damage after the, uh, the end of uh, World War II, was so impressed by, the, by what he saw, or shocked by what he saw, that he turned 180 degrees and devoted his life to um, get rid of nuclear weapons. Fast forward, beyond the atomic bomb, uh, you're a quantum physicist, then you went on to do um, astrophysics, expert in climate change, but you and I have been collaborating now for some time on the nature of fundamental reality. And uh, you have favored through the years uh, the John von Neumann interpretation of quantum mechanics. Can you explain to the audience what that is? So John von Neumann was um, a great uh, physicist, uh, mathematician, and computer scientist. In fact, uh, you know, he made advances in all these fields. And uh, uh, von Neumann was um, concerned about the issue of uh, where is the boundary between what we observe as the so-called physical universe and uh, the mind. And so that led him to ask some very serious questions as to so-called, where is the collapse of the wave function? The wave function being a mathematical construct that uh, describes a quantum system. And uh, by following, you know, uh, the more or less logic, in, in a sense, mathematical logic, if I can put it that way, he concluded that actually he could not draw the boundary between what is uh, if you like, the subject and the object. And uh, the subject, of course, is the uh, ultimately we call the observer. And the object can actually be itself. You know, it can be the subject observing itself or himself or herself. So um, we, what he concluded was that, in fact, this um, boundary, so-called, uh, the so-called so Heisenberg cut, or where is that cut between the world out there and the inner world, it's uh, quite arbitrary, which of course has deep implications about the nature of reality. So today, the competing theories about reality include dualism, mind or consciousness is separate from the body, which I believe violates the laws of uh, thermodynamics. If the mind and body are two separate things, what is the agent that you know, con converts or communicates mind to body. And if you have to invoke an agent, then I'm told that it is not a viable theory. Dualism is not a viable theory because it violates what I just said, the laws of conserv conservation of energy. So that leaves two major theories. One is matter is the only reality. In other words, matter is the ontological primitive. And the other is consciousness is the ontological primitive. Um, those are the only two possibilities if dualism is out. Um, but what I'm hearing from you and our work together is you don't believe that matter, which means everything that we call matter, not just you know, physical objects, but force fields, energy, information, 
these are derived properties of consciousness um, as perceptual activities or cognitive activities of consciousness, the emergence of qualia. Uh, please uh, tell me where you stand on this issue. So the issue of qualia is, of course, uh, uh, perhaps the most fundamental issue that we face in science today. Uh, what is the experience? What is the experience of red? Is my perception of red or is my experience of red the same as yours? This is a uh, question that cannot be answered within the system itself. So experience, um, uh, if, you, if we can put it this way, is everything that uh, consciousness projects so-called out there. But of course the out there is itself an experience. So at the end of the day, um, the out there and the in here, so to speak, must be ultimately nothing more than aspects of the same thing. And what is that thing is what we call consciousness. The point about consciousness is that you cannot take it out. You, if, you, if we imagine that we take consciousness out, if we t imagine that mind is taken out, then what is left? So what is left is actually the non-existent reality. Non-existence in the sense of specific objective existence that we can put our senses onto it, that we can feel it, we can taste it, we can touch it, etc., etc. It is the underlying reality from which experiences uh, themselves are projected through the, through the five senses, if you like, six senses if you include the mind. In other words, it is the mind that is projecting perceptual activity, experiencing itself as what we call the body and the universe. Correct. So if we use the analogy of, of a screen, let's say, uh, we can say that um, consciousness projects itself or herself or himself, it does, let's say itself, consciousness projects itself on its own screen. And it is a little bit, as, we, as you discussed before, um, like a simulation in the sense that projects what appears to be reality on a screen, but actually um, the screen itself is the reality. So if we, if we take an analogy of the background screen being everything, then everything that, that we see on the screen in a way is a figment of our imagination. We create images on the screen. So in reality then, there's no outer reality or inner reality. It's just consciousness fluctuating in what we interpret as inner and outer because as you said, they're both made of the same stuff, which is non-stuff, it's formless non-stuff, therefore infinite non-stuff. If it's formless, then it's got to be infinite. And therefore then dualities themselves are infinite projections. But you know, you can, you, from unity you can have infinite projections out to give an infinity of objects, in fact, an unimaginable number of objects. To go the other way is very difficult because you have so many uh, combinations. It, it's not e even combinatorial as we call it mathematics. It's not even a problem like that. It's way more complicated in that how it does it all fit together that all these disparate realities create unity awareness? It cannot be done. It has to be a projection from unity into multiplicity. The other way, it's not practically impossible, but it really is impossible. I think we have a term, and uh, you know, we use a term in biology, morphogenesis and differentiation. So stem cell is pluripotential, and then it differentiates into different organs, you know, as eyes, nose, but all from the same one pluripotential right. cell. What you're saying is uh, consciousness is totipotential, infinite potential, and differentiates into all knowers, modes of knowing, and objects known it within itself. Within itself, uh, within itself, it appears uh, that it is separate objects, but that appearance is 
what we call materiality. Or, you know, of course, the or matter itself is, is mother, right? <laughs> so matter, if you, if you switch it around, it's okay if we, con if we consider it as birthing of the universe or birthing of infinite number of universe. But to turn it around and say, well, matter has an existence in itself separate from consciousness, it's a mission impossible. Menas, uh, you and I have written a book called You Are the Universe, and, and uh, this is discovering our own cosmic self, that if we go beyond our differentiated experience of the universe to the undifferentiated source of all experience, we realize that we are, in fact, projecting the universe, and that includes the human body and the mind, which is also the constructs created in the same consciousness. Correct. So the mind itself, if we consider it as part of reality, is, if you like, the medium or the way that the projection takes place. This is why the mind is so important, but it's also a trap in itself, because uh, what is the origin of mind? So if, if consciousness is universal, as we are uh, projecting here, as we are claiming here, then the mind itself is part of the universal mind. And then it comes down to what we consider a separate observing selves are nothing more than aspects of the one. But then the one cannot be defined because it is the pure subject. So this is, this is where science ends, and I would say this is also where science begins. And uh, try to turn it around and say, okay, the universe exists independently of all observers. And then who are the observers? Is an amoeba an observer? Is a cell an observer? I would say, yes, absolutely. Where do you draw the line? Von Neumann said, it's arbitrary, you cannot draw the line. So in our, in our case, we are human species, we are homo sapiens. We live on a planet called Earth, around a G2 star or whatever. And um, you know, um, we say whether this is reality. But there's, it has to do with primarily astronomical observations that have to do with the motion of planets around the sun, etc., etc. If we lived in the, in the depths of the oceans, it would be a completely different sense of time. So time and consciousness are very, very important, very fundamental, and it's a big mystery in physics where, what is the origin of time. Enas, thank you. Uh, thank you for your collaboration with You Are the Universe and congratulations on all your work and your previous book, uh, The Self-Aware Universe. I recommend it to everyone and uh, stay tuned for further elaborations on how consciousness creates the universe. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, thank you Deepak, for having me. Thank you.